Welcome to another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. I'm Joe Haberman and I'm very happy to introduce to you today Rebecca Lawrence, um, Managing Director of Faculty 1000. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. <laughs> it's a real pleasure. So, um, we yeah, we it's been a while now and the summer vacations and travels have um, basically not interrupted, but delayed the, this recording. So before we go into the, um, the evolution of Faculty 1000 and um, some of the ups and downs and experiences made along the way, as any organization does, um, you have a pharmaceutical background. What brought you into running an organization or publishing venue like F1000? Basically, what's what's been your journey, in other words? Yes, indeed. Well, it's quite a convoluted and uh, long journey, as I think many people's careers are, actually. Um, you're right. I started, actually, I started uh, as a pianist, uh, trained oh. as, a, as a pianist right at the beginning, um, and then moved into uh, pharmacy uh, and trained and qualified as a pharmacist. And then um, decided I wanted to do research. So I did a PhD in pharmacology. And my original plan was to uh, try and get into the pharmaceutical industry. I was always interested in, in I'm always interested in the practical applications of things. So uh, it was interesting, you know, trying to do research actually might lead to something that might help uh, treat a disease uh, and sort of help society more generally. But while I was looking for those positions, I saw an advert for an assistant editor, copy editing role, basically, um, on a review journal called Drug Discovery Today, uh, something I'd never thought about doing at all, uh, but just piqued my interest. And I thought, well, I might as well apply. Why not? Um, <laughs> to my astonishment, uh, passed the quite challenging grammar test that came beforehand, uh, had the interview. It was a lovely team of people. Uh, and got the job and so that's how I ended up in publishing um, and then I worked so that was a uh, one of the trends journals at uh, Elsevier and I worked there for about seven years in various different roles uh, launching journals and um, sort of developing new products uh, and then from there um, came this opportunity to work with VTech Traj who is a serial entrepreneur, particularly in the scholarly communication space, um, but also actually in navigation. So he was one of the first people to put maps on mobile phones, as very few people know. Uh, but he's very, very interesting uh, individual. And for about 30, 40 years, has been developing new, innovative, very forward thinking ways of uh, you know, taking scholarly communication forward. Uh, including the very first uh, you know, big community on the internet called BioMedNet, which at the time there's a million uh, biologists uh, mm -hmm. as an online community. He then was really the father figure of open access and launched the BioMed Central series. Uh, he founded the Current Opinion series, which again at the time were you know, really uh, very forward thinking in terms of how to do reviews. Uh, and he uh, most recently had launched Faculty of a Thousand, which actually was launched to do something completely different, hence its name. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was originally a virtual faculty of a thousand biologists, and their task was, as they did their research, they would obviously read lots of papers, and they would identify papers that they thought were particularly interesting for one reason or another, and they'd write a short recommendation to say what was interesting about it and, and sort of points of note. Um, mm. And this created essentially a database of recommendations. As you might imagine, quite quickly realized he did more than a thousand uh, uh, biologists uh, and indeed expanded into medicine as well. And so, uh, obviously couldn't change the name of the company so it became from <laughs> faculty of a thousand to f1000 mm -hmm. um and uh so i joined him um actually on a another uh company that he had at the time which is more for the pharmaceutical industry but then moved over to working on f1000 and he was interested in really trying to rethink scholarly communication so obviously he launched by med central in terms of you know trying to drive uh, uh, movement towards open access but was really keen to think about actually there's lots of other issues in the way 
uh, research is communicated and published. And if you started again, in particular the technology that we now all have, how would you do it? And so that was really where from Thousand Research came in. So that's what we launched uh, together uh, 10 years ago, in fact, mm -hmm. um, which was really uh, trying to think, you know, how would you do, how would you do scholarly publishing in a different way? Okay, and then the, the different way was also like to first publish and then add peer review on top. That was quite yes. a novel. How yes, was it like certainly at the time. by the community? Yeah, so at the time it was, I mean, it was ahead of BioArchive, which is obviously archive had been around in the physics community for mm -hmm. a long time. Um, but that was really the only community. There was a little bit of biology that sort of picked it up, but the, you know, really it was mostly the sort of physics and computer science and a bit of the maths community mm -hmm. uh, that were preprinting. Um, and open peer review was not that common and certainly not open peer review on everything. So again, some of the medical journals, uh, particularly BMJ and BMC, were doing uh, open peer review. Um, but not more broadly than that. And open data was something that pretty much nobody was doing at that point. Um, and so we really wanted to bring transparency into the whole process uh, so you could actually see what was going on. And through bringing transparency, you bring rigor, you try and minimize biases as much as you can. And so that's really where the model came about, which is essentially a combination of Sort of the best parts of a preprint and the best parts of journal publishing and sort of bringing them together mm -hmm. um so really enabling a researcher to communicate whatever they want when they're ready which is you know very much one of the the key benefits of, of a preprint is it, there's nobody there to stop you as long as it's you know yeah. a research article there's no uh, in, uh, ethical issues around what you're sharing um and that obviously helps address some of the publication biases that we often see uh, and are often talked about. And then the idea is that you can, uh, that the data is there alongside it. So you have to be able to back up the research because actually the data really is the core of the research rather than the narrative that goes around it. Mm. Um, and equally the software code and the, you know, the methods and materials, you need all that, all that information there. That actually is the core of the paper. And then the peer review process is uh, transparent, so you can see who the reviewers are, what they say. And the other piece is that it's living, so that it's got proper versioning uh, mm -hmm. in the system, so that researchers can update it, it can evolve, they can address concerns as they come up. Um, and so really moving away from this concept of having one version of record or an article. Mm. And, and how, like, from my experience with Africa Archive, now five years on the in, in the in the running, I at the time when we launched, like to to solve a particular issue, the the various like removing the various bottlenecks and challenges that African researchers face when um when with publishing, with biases, language barriers, this and that, it's like. We we thought like a preprint repository would be no brainer to adopt, but then obviously it needs marketing education awareness raising opportunity highlighting whatnot which which is the actual work <laughs> that um and now for you like five years earlier before we launched and, and we're still there like five years later it's it's still a struggle but when you launched faculty 1000 or f1000 now um how yeah how how was it with the adoption of the service and um, by like what or what what initiatives did you take and 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 ways to market the new product to the community? Yeah, no, it's a very good point, and and this is where a lot of new models really do struggle. And I think people underestimate how hard actually it is to try and shift the system and do something in a different way, um, because the incentives in the system do not support that, and particularly given that we were very clear and very careful to um, not get an impact factor because I think our sense was that sort of journal-based metrics in general are you know one of the core problems of a lot of the the you know, issues in the way that research is, is communicated and of course most researchers are you know measures are based around 
uh, journal um, yeah, publications based on the venue and the name of the venue or the impact factor of the venue or other journal-based metrics. Um, so that was always going to be an uphill struggle. On top of which, as I say, we were the first publisher to have a mandatory data policy and researchers were simply not used to the idea of sharing the data and didn't understand why um, and didn't understand the benefits. Today, certainly, right? Like still... Uh, it's still true today, yes. <laughs> exactly. It, it's better, but it's still an issue. But I think um, it's also mostly because everyone's data is so messy and it takes so much effort to clean it up and make it presentable. Not understanding that data is supposed to be messy to a certain degree <laughs> and uh, you can only yes. clean it up so much. But Yeah, no, you're quite right. Um, I think there's also a problem that if you try and sort your data out at the end when you're publishing, it's far mm. harder because suddenly yeah. you're being asked all these questions and you probably can't quite remember exactly what you did and how you did it and oh. you've moved on and you know <laughs> yeah. whereas if you realize as such i'm going to need to do this mm. then as you go along the, the quickest and simplest way is to actually just keep it tidy as you go along track all the details the methods and all the rest of it and so it's a it's an education process but it's a long education process mm. to get around that whole loop but to I mean to try and address some of these things there were a couple of things we did the first thing I mean obviously because we'd come out of the faculty of the thousand and uh we had a, a surprising amount I think uh of support across that virtual faculty of, of really top names actually um across biology and medicine who are very supportive of trying to uh of what we were trying to do um including around the data policy, where actually we got a lot of pushback immediately. And we went to the advisory board and said, do you think we're doing the right thing here? Uh, and to our surprise, they said, stand your ground. This is really important. You mm -hmm. need to you know, maintain that mandatory policy. Um, and just explain to people. And it was interesting. You explained to the researchers why, why we are asking for it, why it's good for the community, but also why it's good for you as a researcher. And invariably, they would then share the, the, the data. But it's just a really time-consuming thing to mm -hmm. do. So that was the first thing that sort of helped, I think, was having key leaders around um, the communities that we were working with, particularly bioinformatics, genomics. So those are areas where researchers are used to sharing. Uh, used to openness and transparency. Um, and then the second thing we did, which I think has made the biggest difference, was really thinking about yeah, the fact that researchers are not incentivized, in fact, disincentivized, I would say, to publish in new entities like this. Um, who are the people that actually have the most influence over researchers? In my mind, that's the research funders. And so that's why we went out to, to look for partners uh, as research funders to really try and support a shift away from the traditional uh, way of publishing. And we developed our partnership with Welcome uh, in 2016, Gates Foundation 2017, and indeed many other funders, the European Commission and others uh, more recently, and indeed now societies and institutions and communities generally, um, where they would support, they would uh, uh, provide a venue, a publishing venue to their grantees, um, using this model of publication, and they would encourage their grantees to publish on there. And that, I think, has probably had the largest impact in terms of mm. um, supporting researchers and making them feel like, you know, it's going to count if I publish on here, even though I don't get an impact factor publication at the end of it. Oh, OK. So they made it semi-mandatory to publish in a short list of venues, basically. Or not, not mandatory, mandatory like, not at all. Recommended. But yeah encourage them this is a good place we think this is a good oh, thing okay. for you to do that kind of thing of course we don't get you know the big top papers but that's fine um actually there's an awful lot of research that researchers do that is just never shared there's a huge amount of research waste i know so in Chalmers always quotes 85 percent uh of research waste in, in medicine people will argue whether that's the right percentage or not but it's very high yeah. <laughs> there's an awful lot of people do never get shared and that's i think one of the great things about preprints and africa archive and you know many other preprints is is that it enables researchers to be able to share anything and everything that they've discovered and some mm. things will be small and incremental and that's fine it will be important to one or two people and if it's important to one or two people it helps them move forward and therefore it's important to share and yeah. also rebalances i think the the literature and our understanding rather than we only see what 
deemed a sort of big impactful findings mm -hmm. we also see the things that didn't work um and get a, a greater understanding of, of more broadly of, of what's going on so so you would say you get a, um like a higher proportion of to something towards negative results like descriptions where researchers are more open about we tried this didn't work but still we got that result which wouldn't be accepted so easily into other venues <laughs> yes i mean we've we've certainly encouraged it heavily as i know many other publishers have done you know sort of sam science publishers plus as an example um and i know preprints uh, encourage this a lot too it's to encourage people to share those um we actually ran quite early on a big campaign to try and encourage people to publish them we got a reasonable number but not the kind of volumes we were hoping for and mm -hmm. uh, did a bit of research afterwards to sort of reach out to people and say why didn't you you know um and i think the main reasons were either the time it takes to write it up when mm -hmm. yes i get a publication but it's i don't get, get as much credit for that as my big impactful paper um, and secondly, the challenge with negative results is often in the lab, you'll do something a couple of times, it doesn't work, you move on. And actually, if you're going to write it up, you have to do it many more times than that and really make sure it's a solid finding and you haven't done something wrong and you know, you're, you're in, you know, um, your reagents aren't wrong or whatever it is that you're using or doing, that there's not something wrong in that before you go and publish it. And often, actually, you just don't have the time, it doesn't work you're going to move on to something else. And I think there's a bit of a problem with that as well. Yeah. Um, it would take more effort and more research to prove it genuinely doesn't work. Yeah. And then resources like time, money, all of that. Exactly. Um, the biggest backlash that preprints still receive is quality assurance. How to make sure. <laughs> I'm sure that was also a, a topic for you guys to deal with. Um, yeah, without going into too much detail, because it's been discussed back and forth. But what, what, how, how, what's your policy around like when you discover oh this this research like after it's been published and not yet peer reviewed actually shouldn't have been published in the first place because it's just poor or whatever like or like, what's your policy around quality assurance in other words. Um, yeah, so if something's already been published and it's found to be problematic, we have the the same policies and adhere to the same type guidelines, like committee yeah. of uh, publication ethics, as any journal. So, you know, we have the same retraction policies and withdrawal policies and all the rest of it, and so we adhere to the same things. Mm. Um, but there are a couple of things. I mean, that's the one thing that's a, a really fundamentally problematic, right? I think there is a couple of things here, though. One is, although we are... The, the first step in our process is like a preprint. Mm -hmm. um, what I think is different there is the level of checks that we do. And they really are quite extensive. And in fact, we're doing some work at the moment to actually make it far more visible uh, to the readers and the community more generally what things have been checked. Um, mm -hmm. So much more rigour around the integrity and and. Um, uh, and, and information and the ethics and etc but also particularly around more open research elements so you know the rigor of the method section does it adhere to standards does it adhere to reporting uh, guidelines do we have detail of the materials that we used uh, ideally with unique identifiers mm -hmm. uh, do we have the data is it in the right format is it sort in the right place is it you know people access it you know all of those things so it's actually quite an extensive set of checks and yeah. then i think by even by asking for the research data helps uh to address some integrity uh aspects because you know it's harder to fabricate data or you know uh, uh you know edit data without it being more obvious mm. um but then the flip side is once you publish i mean so we reject about 50 percent of what's submitted before it's even published just going through that process and then once it's published because the peer review process is open and because there's versioning it allows you know if, if a reviewer says hang on a minute you haven't quite got that right or that analysis isn't quite correct or your conclusions are way out from what you've actually seen or whatever 
the authors can revise, they can address it. It's an evolving thing, right? And it, it changes, I think, the nature of the peer review uh, to really make it a almost a collaboration, as in the reviewers are there to help the authors improve the quality of what they found. Um, so I think the transparency across the process helps with the integrity, but I do think we need probably more checks across the board. And I think, you know, as a community, you know, preprint servers, publishers, you know, and others indeed that are doing um, various types of validation on top of preprints, I think we need to come together and, and agree a set of sort of standards. And there are some, some of this is already happening. FOSS is already doing the open science indicators. We've already got central open science doing various types of badges and things. But I think it would be really helpful for the community for us to have consistency about how we talk about what checks have and haven't mm. been done. And checks, I mean, ranging from basic checks these to peer review. They're all sort of different types of checks. I think we need to elevate non-peer review checks because for small incremental studies, that mm. may be all we need. We don't need full-blown peer review on every single thing, which is why I think we've got such a massive peer review burden issue. We need to recognise the value of some of these uh, checks, but we need people to be able to, when they come across a finding on any of these kind of venues, to understand what has been checked, what hasn't been checked, what's it passed, what's it not passed. Uh, yeah. So I think there's a real, a real task for us all together to do that. Yeah, and also to acknowledge that not every reviewer can possibly know everything they're supposed to validate or yeah, counter validate on a research paper. I like very much the fact when you said that the process is set up in such a way that it's actually supporting the researchers to present the results in the best possible way. And instead of how it often happens, sending them back to the lab to repeat their experiments or add other experiments, they don't even have the resources or time for anymore. <laughs> This is, I think, one of the, the most discouraging <laughs> reviews you can get. Like, of we are in, in the second range of experiments, other projects, but not. And now a review from a paper that we actually planned to publish two years ago <laughs> comes back like, what? <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, it's, uh, uh, but I think, I mean, your point about, about uh, reviewers, you know, and, and it only being a couple of years, I think is really important because we, we as a community, but there's huge weight on the fact that a couple of people have looked at it, probably rushed in between a load of other things that they're trying to get done too. Um, and we assume once they've looked at it, you know, if they've said it looks fine, it must be correct. And if they haven't looked at it, it must be wrong or it's mm. likely to be wrong. And it just doesn't make any sense. But the other thing is, I think we we peer review everything in the same way. And mm. so... As you say, you know, if it's a really big study with lots of different, you know, methods and really you know, quite uh, an important outcome, you need a really solid peer review. And it may be that it's it's valid to say actually you need an additional thing here to really make that a solid conclusion. Mm. If it's a small incremental finding, we don't need that kind of peer review. Probably not from the same kind of people, not to the same extent, yeah. you know. We're wasting a lot of people's time on really small things that are really going to impact and benefit a couple of people anyway, potentially. And I think we need to be much more nuanced about how we peer review, who peer reviews. I think we can broaden the pool of peer reviews much more for all sorts of different types of findings rather than you know, consistently have the same type of people being targeted again and again, everything. Mm. Um, so I think there's a lot of a lot of work for us all to do that. Yeah. Um, just like from the system, how it's set up, how much of a rebuttal is possible on the review level? I know that, like I've, I've also with a colleague published a paper in, in faculty F1000. Do people still say faculty 1000? Because my supervisor at the PhD 10 years ago used to say, but, but it's, a, it's known as F1000. F1000, F1000, yes. So it sounds, yeah, it sounds very posh when you say faculty 1000. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so basically, so that you have the review reports, which you can openly see on the on the on the with the right panel. And then there is a section for the authors. Well, authors can send their responses uh like th th by email or through the system to the reviewers directly, and it doesn't necessarily have to show up in, in the system, I think, from what I remember. Or it will be displayed. But then can the reviewers respond to the response? Or is it Absolutely. Oh, 
no absolutely so we encourage authors to respond to the reviewers and, and those will be obviously published alongside the peer review report um but equally the reviewers can respond back you know i mean it gives an opportunity for authors to say actually reviewer you misunderstood this or i don't agree with you or whatever um mm -hmm. or great point i'll make the change whatever it is right mm -hmm. and and allows that discussion back and forth including with readers so readers can get involved in the conversation too yeah, no, as we know on all sites it's actually often quite difficult to to get people to publicly mm -hmm. comment which i think is is unfortunate i guess there aren't incentives in, in most cases to do that but there are papers that are you know whether they're more controversial or they're more impactful where we have had a lot of good discussion between the authors the reviewers others getting stuck in We've had people talk about the papers on Twitter and we encourage them to pull that onto the, the mm. paper as well so that it's not lost, it's all kind of there together. And I think it's really valuable and important actually for a reader to be able to see that discussion and be able to mm. understand the different perspectives and the debates around it. Because a lot of areas, there is a lot of debate and different viewpoints and who knows which one is the right viewpoint, but at least you can see that breadth and see where those discussion points are. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, uh, like we're researchers, or researchers, we we literally work at the edge of knowledge. So none of us can really know for sure what's what's being presented and how it's to be interpreted. And every researcher comes with their own package of experiences and assumptions of how data is supposed to be interpreted based on where they're coming from and what discipline or research area. So, so yeah, I I very much appreciate the. The move towards again, like to have it as a collegial exercise instead of a bottleneck and and top down um, uh, activity. Um, so now there's there's some efforts in reusing peer reviews across different journal systems, with which in your case, I think would make sense because it's already public. Or do you see a way to tie that in with other no, whatever is being published in F1000 stays there. I think we're talking more about closed peer review and that then the re review reports can be passed down to other editorial boards to consider. Instead yes, of I mean, to, to have such redundancy and, and extra work. Yeah, I think there are some great initiatives out there looking at how we can reuse those peer review reports. Because as you say, it's often what happens um, is that it's it's you know if it's rejected from that journal then you're starting again somewhere else and um, we're you know keen to engage with that it's harder for us because we require the full transparency of the peer review um including the reviewer's name um and so if the review's been done elsewhere we need to make sure that obviously the reviewer is happy for their uh name and review report to go up um but in principle very you know, happy to share those. It's I think one thing that will one thing that will help us as a community is to have more standards around who, what, the type of of things that we might ask in a peer review report, because this is often the challenge, isn't it? Is that I think, you know, or go to another journal unless unless you've got, say, review commons where you've got a set of journals and a set of editors who have pre-agreed um that whoever gets the peer review report, I will recognize it um, and count it. Um, then you do have the challenge that often editors will say, well, I want to invite my own people that I know, or it doesn't quite answer the questions that I want answering, or you know, all of those kind of things. So I think having some elements of consistency around it, not they're all exactly the same, so they're not all going to be, but um I think probably help there. Um but I think it, I think it's important for us to figure out how to do that. The challenge, I know this is a challenge with with the, all the groups that are sort of been doing this at the moment, is how to make this work in a in a uh, financially uh, a sustainable way. Because often the work will have been done somewhere else by mm. a completely different entity, <laughs> and the entity that then gets the publication might be you know a different publisher or a different community or a different whatever it is. Mm um and so how do you make that system work i mean ideally you know where you know 
and obviously th this all connects into the whole APC system, which in itself is problematic. But mm -hmm. certainly in an AP system, you have a problem where, you know, the APC is being paid at the venue that didn't really do the work for it. And then you need some kind of agreement as to how you cover the costs. And this is where it gets very messy. Um, now I know there's a lot of, you know, um, work going in and we're equally uh keen to figure out how we move beyond apc so i think we all recognize you know there's mm -hmm. significant benefits in having shifted uh certainly to open access but i think probably you know over to where we are at the moment but we've got you know further significantly further to go to really try and fully address it because it has just opened up new challenges and new imbalances in the system mm. um and the solution to that may help us address some of the solutions around the sustainability around being able to move around uh peer view i mean the other the other comment though is that we're still working in a system where the version of record is all that matters yeah. and actually to some extent you've got your peer review sorry you've got your preprint somewhere you've got peer reviews coming in could come in from a number of different places could it come from one provider getting the peer review it doesn't mm. really matter and once it's, well, there's a question of what does passing peer review mean? It's arbitrary. Um, uh, and everybody's got a different view as to what that what counts as passing peer review. But once you've got those peer review reports in, and if you've got some positive peer review on there, actually, it should be done, right? There's this extra step that we require at the moment that has to go into a publication mm -hmm. to the general venue names and, and impact vectors. That doesn't really make sense. So. I mean, I think one of the things that VTech and I always sort of envisioned is the idea that ideally you would be in a place where you put your research out, you you would maybe contract an, a, a supplier of some description to run and manage the, the independent peer review, which I think is important that it's independent, you've got you know, that uh, validity of the, the assessment that's been done on it. And then beyond that, maybe journals actually move to being more curators and sort of badging things. And yeah, essentially cool. content can rise, right? The more and more badges in different places. Like but, but, but that's a vision I also had, like eventually with all these preprint initiatives, also like Africa. <laughs> um and and like the call for re the research the research community needs to own their output. But yes, we need editorial services, and there's not necessarily a harm for corporate publishers as long as it's affordable and and you know serves the system. And um, so I think we can all agree to that. But then, uh, so yeah, I I also feel what you just said. Like, don't we need more curation instead of more and more journals with which what yeah. Mm -hmm. So especially the 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 usual suspects, the the big five has has ventured into like thousands, like literally thousands of different journals with overlapping um scopes of of research, and then like where's the curation aspect, and isn't that what we need to make sense of the information again in the first place? Why do we do research? And it's 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 become such a game where it's it's like the research gets stuck in the publishing pipeline, and that's where it ends instead of being curated in a way that's meaningful and yes, assigning tags for research disciplines, but it's not granular enough, I feel, to for other societal stakeholders to then go in and, and find the actual research that's relevant for their implementation on societal and environmental levels or industry even. Like I had a um Jeff Funk on, on the podcast a couple of months ago by now who was said like it's, it's actually measurable and it's really sad and threatening that innovation in the industry space has declined dramatically. So we're not innovating anymore because there's too much knowledge and too much unsolved knowledge out there. <laughs> it makes sense of. Um, and that's an actual problem, especially looking at the threats and challenges we're facing. Um, so so yeah, I agree with you, like journals and publishers should should take the the curation, the content curation aspects more seriously again but now how can you do that with particularly 1000 <laughs> but that was the advocate question because you're basically you're, you're you're focused on life sciences primarily but not exclusively or is this basically also where you have more 
the majority and or what is your curational approach to make sure that that the information is reusable not only by by researchers but also others who might be interested like journalists or other societal actors or where do you see the role where what do you what you just said where also faculty 1000 in particular could head towards the next 10 years yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good point. And, and I don't think we have all the answers at this point. But uh, I, I mean, it's an interesting cycle, right? Because actually going back to back in 2000, at the beginning, the idea was mm -hmm. never mind where the content is published, mm -hmm. just flag up things that are particularly interesting, um, maybe interesting for that community. It might be a real, you know, it might be a I don't know, a cell biology paper and somebody from, from plant biology comes in and says, actually, this is really useful for us over here. Or, you know, it could be can we come a different field, right? Um, neurosciences and plant biology, whatever. Um, so it could, so and what was really interesting is the majority of what they picked up were not in those big, you know, top impact factor journals, right? There's lots of great stuff published all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's lots of stuff that maybe isn't so great like published in some of the bigger titles. So um so I think we're sort of coming around all the loop, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the hard bit, and this is what we we found challenging. I think we, you know, we're probably in a better place now that we're part of Taylor and Francis, which obviously has a big corpus uh, of journals uh, across disciplines. Um, actually, does have quite a lot in in science and technology, but obviously it also has a real strength in HSS, which we are increasingly publishing in um, on F one thousand as well. Um, I think there's an opportunity to really try and tackle that curation piece that, that I think many uh, of us in the industry are trying to figure out how to do and how to shift um, the role of journals or, or the role of, I mean, journals are really a community of, you know, the editors, the sort of top, uh, top leaders in the field there and, and a community of people around it. So, you already have within a journal a basis of that curation mm. and that's why i say i think it's i think we need to rethink what that group do the challenge is we can't do this as publishers alone or uh you know yeah as a community uh, of sort of involved in communication and research alone we have to do this together with the funders and the institutions particularly mm because it involves them changing how they measure uh, the, the quality of the research, how they measure researchers, the funding, the careers, et cetera. These things have to go hand in hand. There are some, you know, some starts and movement toward that. Obviously, eLife, um, I know Plus have been looking at this, you know, many others are sort of starting to try and figure out how to really make this publish review curate approach work. Um, but there's lots of challenges with it currently. And, uh, you know, the biggest one, I think, is shifting uh, the incentive system, which obviously we can't do. So I think what's really essential is that we work together as a group of stakeholders uh, to figure out, maybe start small, because when you try and tackle the whole thing, it's so big that nobody can really quite figure out how to move. Maybe we just start small. Mm. Um, one particular area uh, and actually just try and rethink this place but as we know uh, cultural change is something that takes a long time but I think that, you know over the last 10 years we've actually looking at it moved quite a quite a way in many regards in some regards we haven't and in some regards we really have um, but we've still got a long way to go to mm. really make the shifts that I think we all want and can all see the benefit of but talking about which, what, what's the biggest achievement you think you and the F1000 team all together achieved over the past years? Also, could, could also have been along the way. Like, what was the major milestone that you kind of placed? I think the, the, the most, the, the, the point at which probably had the most impact going forward was that initial partnership with Welcome. I think that was a real you know, tipping point for us to, if you want to describe it that way, in the sense that, you know, publishers traditionally don't have, don't really work very closely with funders. And indeed, I think at that point, it was very much everybody was blaming each other 
other problems in the system and weren't really talking collaboratively with each other at all. Um, and so that was a big step forward and I mm. think has really brought, you know, certainly, you know, in our discussions, much closer in terms of really working together with the different stakeholders mm. has enabled, uh, you know, it's a big step for a funder to do that too, right? I mean, funders don't have uh, get involved in publishing normally or have their own publishing platform so that was a big step for them but it enabled and encouraged um, other major players to do something similar and to you know really start to work together to think about how can we do this collectively so I think that's probably um, the biggest point and I think having stuck with the data policy despite mm -hmm. many pushes and challenges <laughs> and hard questioning of Really, is this the right thing to do? I think absolutely it was the right thing to do. What I was mean, that? We... Argue, arguments against? I mean, just land The fear. arguments. Fear yeah, the fear. argument against is if you go so far out to the ideal, there were so few people that would be willing to come there that you'll get those that come there, but the rest of the community just won't. It's too big a jump for the rest of the community and you actually want to move the community because it's so much work to clean the data to present because it's it. too much work um you know people worried about being scooped um uh don't have the time and the funding to do it um doesn't get properly incentivized and recognized at the end mm. you know those are sort of the the, the main arguments um and it was always a, a question of do we go right out there and say we, this is the ideal in terms of the, the transparency and we're going to stick to it or actually is it more effective to do it step by step and sort of try and bring the community with you and you know you can argue it both ways we ended up falling down of that actually let's let's go for, for where we think we ought to be um, because you can really argue why you think that should be and why that's better for everybody um, yeah, for the researcher as well as the community mm -hmm. and then try and encourage more uh, down that road and it's great you know PLOS obviously then went out with a, a data policy others are now increasingly going out with the uh, you know a full requirement data policy which is great and, and then you've got obviously some of the, the big policy um you know funder policies and uh, national policies around that too which is really really excellent to see mm. yeah i mean you mentioned that the incentive system is changing too slowly or not really despite all the discussions and and guidelines and principles and initiatives happening but isn't your approach that you outlined um in the beginning of this conversation that the way you check for rigor upon acceptance into F1000 like to get it published in the first place wouldn't that be a checkpoint also for research assessment to make sure that the methodology is clearly described and all of that like what what we've been unlearning as a scientific community as a whole researchers and publishers alike to because of lack of space in the in the print version which is not an argument anymore but still a habit <laughs> Um, to just reverse that and then use that as a as an assessment wouldn't that be like the easiest way forward and then to measure yeah i'm, I'm just saying am i missing something um and then instead of well we need to get rid of the impact factor that's clear <laughs> yes and that's fine. no i i think i think you're right there's definitely something in there i mean that, that's one of the reasons why i think it's really important that we get consistency across us all as as providers of checks um at different levels as to not not that we're all doing necessarily the same checks but we're all got the same definitions as to what a certain check is right so that then you know a a organization can say i only want you to sign content that's passed these types of checks or got these types of badges on it or whatever it is right which gives them the the sort of sense okay this has gone through a rigorous set of checks and I trust that these checks have been done. It's 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 all down to obviously the the trust side of things, and equally re rebalancing that against peer review and the uh, the validation that that gives. So mm. it'll probably be hard. I mean, just as I think an increasing number of indexes are bibliographic indexes are keen to start to think about how to index preprints and how to then. Uh, include in there what level of validation has gone on there. It's hard for all of these entities to do it if we're all doing it in different ways and we don't surface actually what we do and don't do. And, you know, 
So I think that's why it's so important that we come up with some consistent language as to what different checks are, what's involved in them. Um, and then, yeah, I, 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 you know, again, start small, figure out a pilot. Um, I mean, it, 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 at least I think the growing awareness and, and recognition, understanding across most organisations around the world now around the importance of changing the incentive system. It surprises me. I, I'm on the board of Dora and, and, and surprised me still the number of places that don't quite understand why or that we need to. Why but I think that is it this way? Why should it's working for us? So why should we change it? <laughs> exactly. 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 Not so perfect. I think those conversations are happening and it, it mm. and, and people are recognizing. So that's the first step, recognize the problem. Um and there are some institutions doing some good work to really try to change the way they assess. But it's not just the institution, of course. Fundamentally, the people doing the assessment are the mm. research community. And that's where we've really got to, you mm. know, change minds about how things are done at mm. all levels. And not just the, the next generation, the early career researchers, but also the more senior researchers who are doing the assessment. Mm. Um, and regardless of what their institutional funder policy is, will naturally do it a certain way unless we really uh, yeah, address that and explain why uh, it's so important to think differently about it. Mm. I like to invite it to, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a bit too much to ask, but uh, okay, so lately in discussions, I've come up with a thought and also expressed it like, do we still have the luxury to do research just because, uh, for, for the sake of it, just to learn? Or don't we have enough challenges to actually solve? the issues that we've put on this planet as a yeah as, as humankind um uh so basically it goes down to the question of why are we doing research and then what is the publisher's role so you sometimes ask yourself these questions and is f1000 trying to find a way or would that be even considerable to find a way to shape or to, to incentivize researchers to be more solution oriented in their research and publish that primarily or preferably? Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. I think there is, I think there is a real role for basic research that isn't, isn't all, you know, tied to a specific goal, because I think, you know, when we look back at mm -hmm major discoveries that fundamentally actually have had a significant benefit on society they've often come from basic researchers yeah. just exploring yeah. and understanding not, so if we stop doing that i think we'd yeah no i'm not risk. questioning basic research per se because i've also been in that um kind of um community of researchers there's applied research of you just differentiate the two applied research and basic research but uh, my background is in evolutionary development in biology to basically prove the classic animal tree of life right or wrong on a molecular level. And then that has to do with biodiversity. And when you can ask, so there's no direct impact, but also what we understand and, and can, again, measure, but also um, see the correlations between how different species evolved from each other and, and where are they still alive today. Like it helps environmental protection and, and animal species protection that we got eventually well i don't know but you can always yeah. argue but the question is should researchers in their research proposals argue more towards and can that be also something that publishers take on to, like what what's the purpose of this research in the first place yes uh i still think i mean there is a lot more of that we see a lot more of that in a lot of um you know, uh, criteria. Well, we don't, but you know, the the, the broader community in terms of the criteria as to how how you get funding for things is you often do need to sort of try and extend it. Now, often people write things that are uh, you know, um, I would say far fetched, but you know, it, it, you, you if you want to get funding, right, you're going to write some kind of connection on there. And so, mm -hmm. does that actually help shift things? I don't know. Um, and I still think there is a role for more blue sky research because I think, you know, you often don't know what the, the in, potential impact of it is, but often it does lead to discoveries that do have a significant impact. So I'm not so sure about that. What mm -hmm. I do think, though, is uh, that we probably, you know, we fund, we collectively, society fund um, a huge amount of research. And actually, 
uh, there is evidence that that isn't really taking us any further forward at a, at a greater pace. And I do wonder whether we, you know, whether we should do almost less research at better and better quality. And it goes back to the data point that, you know, researchers say, well, I don't have time because I need to get more papers and, and all the rest of it. I'd rather they did fewer papers uh, and there was less output, but it was better quality. They'd done replicated things enough times to really be able to stand behind it. They'd shared things properly with that you can actually really reuse and really test out. Yeah. And we can yeah. probably build on solid foundations, whereas yeah. at the moment, everything's, you know, not that strong. And we have this whole reproducibility issue, as we know, across many fields. And yeah. so I do think there is a need for that. I think as publishers, I think our role as a service provider, it is to enable researchers to share findings they've shared. And it's then to support researchers in getting those findings to the right people, uh, you know, so plain language summaries and all of those kind of you know, ways of trying to get outputs to the right people so they have the impact that they you know should have in the right places. Mm. And back to your point about curation, I think there's definitely a role for publishers in thinking better about there's a huge corpus, growing corpus of, of content. How do you support the research community in actually trying to find you know the gems amongst all of that and, and piece together what all of this means? Mm. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um from here. Do you see preprint repositories uh as a competitive place or part of the ecosystem or something that you're already working with in uh some sort of workflows? Are you are you um kind of partnering with my archive? Sorry if I could have done yeah. my research better. No, 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 that's <laughs> fine. No, we do partner. Um we're part of their their um day to day. Uh, ecosystem we're often uh discuss uh with you know, colleagues on, on preprint servers i mean i see preprint servers as part of the ecosystem i think you know you all have different um benefits that we can provide into that system and i think they're an important part of, of the evolution of where we're going so mm. yeah um so is there something you can basically uh, share from what's next for F1000 for the next decade or five years plan? Basically, yeah, we... I mean, I think I think it's many of the things that we've talked about. I think it's, um, you know, it's looking at that whole curation aspect. Um, that is something that I think is really important that isn't solved and uh, anywhere really mm. um but i think it's critical i think it's looking at peer review and what peer review means and different types of peer review really rethinking that i think it's looking at the checks and really rebalancing validation more broadly um Does that and mean that you're planning to change also the system in f1000 and how the peer review is being displayed or coordinated or is it because it looks pretty straightforward and like uh, like the way it was set up a decade ago, still working. Or yes, we are though um, looking at. So, yeah, we've learned a lot over the last ten years about how that uh, uh, system works. So we are uh, in the process of making some tweaks and adjustments to it, um, and um, there'll be more coming out uh, in the next uh, few months about those and just, just really streamlining the process and making it easier for authors, easier for viewers, easier for readers. But we are looking actively at the checks part of it because it's such a big part of what we do and it's mm. pretty much invisible and most people don't realise the yeah. amount of effort we go in to do that. Mm. Um, and so that we will be doing um, as, you know, starting by making that a lot more visible um, and then, you know, we're already uh, starting to work with uh, parts of the community to really think about how do we do that in a consistent way uh, mm. across the industry. So I think, you know, thinking about that validation side of things uh, and, and rethinking some parts of it, I think is going to be really important. Um, obviously, thinking about how, how we move collectively beyond uh, APCs, I think it's going to be a really important thing for us to do. Mm. 
uh, and as I say, thinking about that curation piece. So there are some big meaty challenges still uh, to work on that we're you know actively working on mm. with you know our our sort of colleagues across the industry broadly, uh, but also with other stakeholders uh, in the community because. As I say, I think the only way we're going to solve a lot of these challenges is by working closely and collegially together. Um, and I think the, the current sort of tension between sort of the commercial providers and the community is is probably what well, I, I can sort of partly recognise where it's coming from. It, it's it's unhelpful actually. <laughs> I think we need to, um, yeah, we've all got a lot to contribute to this, and I think we need to work collectively together if we're genuinely going to solve some of the big issues that we've got today yeah i think also like you said like to make the processes like or, or to describe the the quality check processes i think that's a big learning curve for everyone and then can also encourage others to up their game or to share theirs and then learn from each other exactly and then we'll also have researchers to do better in the way they present their research in the first place yeah yeah, I think I can, yeah. Hmm. Uh, what what's the what are the biggest um cost items um for you with Packet One Thousand with the APCs? What's the biggest um cost that give rise to the APC model, or uh, basically make the biggest part of it of the APC in Packet Two One Thousand? No, I got it right. It's that. a mixture of of some of those checks, particularly around the more open research elements. Um, that really does require a lot of human time um yeah, you get that like when when you described that and it was just like wow that's a lot of expertise you're recruiting for every submission <laughs> it is it is i think it's really important to do um but it is and then it's the peer review i mean the, the peer review as with every provider it's increasingly challenging it's getting harder and harder to find uh, reviewers because it's we're all largely targeting the same group with a growing growing um mm -hmm. corpus of content and they're also getting busier doing other things too. Um, and so it's it's managing that that peer review process is the other uh part that I would say is, is um you know most significant cost. Um we do actually display on our platforms, um, we have a sort of cost transparency wheel, so we're very open and transparent about the yeah, percentage of, of work that goes into the different elements around the service. But I'd say those are the two biggest ones. Yeah, we can link to that another example for homework. Miss, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, wow, is there some okay? Like your uh, latest piece in the scholarly um kitchen um about open infrastructure and, and um how different service providers can purposefully and um friendly instead of competitively. Um, work together to orchestrate not only scholarly publishing but science communication at large. In a nutshell, <laughs> can you summarize what you wrote there? Or what's what's basically a, a short verbal description of of your points made there? Yeah, I guess exactly. I think we need to. I mean. Uh, all stakeholders actually need to work uh, at, at providing much more um, unique identifiers across the system and capturing better metadata. Because we all do that. We will take a lot of burden off mm -hmm. researchers, particularly, and that's the most important thing for us all to do, um, so that they can focus on doing the research, right? Um, rather than endlessly having to re-enter information into all our different systems, um, which also provides loopholes, by the way, for you know, to enable it where there is problematic behaviour, it enables some of that um, and makes it easier uh, to do that. So um, we certainly have tried to capture as much metadata and as much unique identifiers across the, the piece as we can, whether it's you know ORCID IDs or funder IDs or mm. you know IDs on different types of outputs as well. Um, and I think the more that we all do that, the more that we can connect mm. the systems up and the infrastructures that we each have, the more we can make it easier for researchers and easier for us, easier to track integrity, 
uh, and and you know and and validate uh, integrity of, of outputs and uh, individuals and all the rest of it. Um, so uh, yeah, my argument is is really to encourage uh, all all parts of the system to capture much greater metadata and and therefore to enable parts of the system to be much better interoperable, which I think mm. is, is, is critical. But basically adopting persistent identifiers and also standards, metadata standards, so which are often not only discipline specific, but down to the project level. So some metadata is but but there is always you would think a cross cut of what's a must have as a metadata, like description title of keywords, obviously. But then, and what is nice to have and what, what is discipline specific? And some disciplines have that clearly defined, but then it's not often known to everyone in that community. So, um, or the genres are not aware of existing community standards. So who is there like a central database for such? Anyways, open question. Well, there is there is bio sharing um, or fair sharing, I should say, it's now called. Yeah. Um, which uh, I was part of uh, working with uh, Susanna Sansoni from the University of Oxford and others um, that put together this big database which captured mm. uh, it captured policies of, of publishers, publish, uh, policies of funders, but also then captured um, uh, standards uh, across communities and tried to capture well, how validated are they? Because you know, at what point does it actually become a standard as opposed to somebody's proposed it and a couple of people agree, but not everybody. You know, it's all of those things. Um, mm -hmm. it's not straightforward to do. Um, and then of course you've got things like the equator uh, networks have an awful lot of standards in there, and so there are some some core cool places to go for some of those. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're right. But I mean, the first part is capturing the basic message <laughs> is where we're still at unfortunately you know there are bits here and pockets there but actually mm -hmm. most of the system are not capturing the basics yeah. uh, and that's the first place to start i think and removing redundancies and exactly typos and stuff well okay um is there anything that comes to mind that would you like to get off your chest as a result of this conversation because i I get a feeling we've covered quite a quite a range. I think we've covered a lot. Absolutely. I think <laughs> uh, I think we've talked about some of the key things that I, I think are really important and, and um areas that I think we need to collaborate on. I mean, I think that's the, the biggest thing here in my mind is that we all need to work together to to address the changes that are needed. Um, and it's not going to be easy. It's not easy. We're, we're seeing that. Um, but I would hope to see in the next five to ten years the same kind of speed of progress that I think actually we have made if we mm. look back over the last five to ten years. Um, we need to continue and maintain that um, mm. and maybe even increase it would be really good. Uh, so and it feels like mostly there's a willingness there to do that and a recognition of this. And now we actually just have to do it. Yeah, I think so too. Like it looks like most, if not all, stakeholders are willing to, to some extent at least. I mean, everybody's also protecting their own hood, but um, there's a common understanding that co collaboration and um, yeah, is necessary in order to achieve the bigger goal of making research output applicable to societal needs, but also more efficient, also better, more rigorous, more transparent. I think we're all in the same boat now. It's just a matter of who's rowing in what direction. <laughs> but, yes. but I think we have we, we're rowing towards the sunset or sun dawn. Like I'm trying to find a sunrise, yeah. Um yeah. trying to find a positive ending here. <laughs> That's an yes. Yeah. I think we are. I think we're going in the right direction. We're all gradually aligning bit by bit. So we're all kind of broadly going the same direction, which is great. Yeah. And now we really need to starts going yeah thank you so much rebecca it's been quite an enlightening so and exciting conversation to have no, thank what you very you? much enjoyed it well, thank you for asking me and all the best for for the next 10 years for the for thousand and wherever life takes us indeed and all the best to our too thank you mm -hmm.